Before we start, if you're enjoying these conversations, please make sure that you like, subscribe, and leave a review or comment for cleaning up. It really helps other people to find us. Also, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. And follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram, where you can watch highlights from each episode, read my takeaways, and keep up with all things cleaning up. And finally, don't forget to visit cleaningup.live, where you can access over 150 hours of conversations with extraordinary climate leaders, and you can subscribe to our free newsletter. That's all on cleaningup.live. Now, let's get started. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation. Hello, I'm Michael Liebreich, and this is Cleaning Up. My guest today is Professor Ben Flubier, Emeritus Professor at the University of Oxford and the IT University of Copenhagen, and the world's leading expert on the subject of mega projects and project delivery. His latest book is called How Big Things Get Done, although, as we're about to find out, it's mainly about how big things get done late, over budget, and failing to deliver the benefits they promised. Please welcome Professor Ben Flippier to Cleaning Up. So, Professor Flippier, thank you so much for joining us here on Cleaning Up. Thank you for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. Could we start, perhaps, by you describing what you do, what you research, in your own words, because I could... Uh, make something up, but I'll probably get it wrong. So what is your thumbnail sketch of yourself? So uh, I'm a professor first and foremost at Oxford University and at the IT University in Copenhagen. And what I research is uh, big projects. So really big, often multi-billion pound or multi-billion dollar uh, ventures, capital investments in all sorts of areas from IT to transport infrastructure to mining, uh, to defense projects, uh, to energy projects, uh, all sorts of energy projects. Uh, and, and so anything that's big and complex, that's my uh, remit. And that's what I do. On on top of the research and teaching that I do as a professor, I do a lot of consulting and executive education, uh, training leaders. There's a real need for people to get better at this because we have difficulty with big projects. So there's a real need and a real demand actually out there for top leaders who are responsible for these projects to get the most recent knowledge and skills on how to do better. That's what I do. And along those lines, um, my audience that watches on YouTube, which is about 20%, so most people will be listening on the podcast, but the audience on YouTube might be able to see over my shoulder there uh, that I've got your book, uh, the latest of, I believe, 10 books, but it's called How Big Things Get Done. Ah, and you're holding it up for those on the podcast you can't see but uh, uh bent is hel holding up a copy of his book as well um so that is part of your process of presumably educating executives and people like our audience on the challenges of these big projects right yes it is and like you said i've written several books before but this time i wanted to do something i had never done before something special which would be two things to take stock of where I am now, how much I know about these things and put it all in one book. So instead of having sort of a specialized book on just uh, an aspect of the knowledge, I wanted to put my accumulated knowledge over uh, my life up to this date uh, into that book. And I wanted to do it, this is the second thing, I wanted to do it in a way where everybody could read it, anybody, you know, anybody who would be in a, you know, airport bookstore picking up a book, would pick up this book and look at it and, and say, whoa, that, that's actually relevant to what I'm doing. Uh, because we all do projects, whether big or small, and we cover both big and small projects in the book. And by we, I mean my co-author, Dan Gardner, and myself. But anyways, that's what I wanted to do with the book, uh, present my accumulated knowledge in a way where anybody could understand it, anybody who's doing projects. And I've read the book. I read it um bits of it early and then in preparation for this conversation and I can vouch for the fact that it's extremely readable there's lots of anecdotes lots of stories uh, but also a, a structure and a thesis um, can you start us off by saying how big is the problem of projects big things 
not getting done properly? How Can you put some metrics on, you know, what would the world look like if we actually could do this stuff properly? If we all read the book and all followed its lessons, what, what would we save or what would happen? Well, to put, put numbers on the problem, we do that in the book and we actually have a name for it. We call it the iron law of project management. And the iron law basically says over budget, over time, under benefits, over and over again. And that's, that's a, 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 that's a law documented by hard statistics. And, and we see that only around 9% of projects are on budget and on schedule. So 9%, meaning that uh, over 90% are not on budget and not on schedule. And now if you add on benefits, then it's half a percent. That's half of 1% are on budget, on time, and deliver the promised benefits. And that's a dismal statistics. This is based on the biggest large, the biggest database of its kind, you know, with 16,000 plus uh, projects in it. At first, when we saw these numbers, we had a, a, a rather smaller database, just a few hundred projects, 258 to be precise, which was the world's largest database at the time. We had the same result basically, but we thought it could be an artifact of the small sample. So we started sampling more. So we, we selected a few hundred, uh, collected a f uh, data for a few hundred more projects, still the same result. Then we collected data for a thousand more projects, still the same result. And now we have 16,000 plus, still the same result. So it's a very robust uh, number. And now, you know, in the meantime, other colleagues have started to do research on the same thing as we do. So you don't have to trust us actually only. You can also look to our colleagues and they find similar numbers. So we uh, consider it a pretty uh, firm uh, result, you know, a pretty firm finding that projects are actually performing dismally, not only badly, but dismally. And then on top of that, we have this thing about fat tails, you know, black swans, that it's not only that they perform badly, but a large percentage of the majority of project types perform extremely badly, you know, with huge blowouts, not just somewhat uh, over budget, but like a total blowout of hundreds and hundreds of percent over budget. And the same with the schedule and benefits. So the situation is grim. That's the only way to describe it. Luckily, you know, a lot of people are now interested in improving the situation. So there's, let me give you two personal touch points. As I was reading the book, um, there were two things that really appealed to me. You talked about, um, actually both of them in that, in your, in that comment. One is the reliance on statistics. Now you may not know how new energy finance, the company that I started, that I then sold to, uh, Mike Bloomberg that is now Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the leading information provider globally on the net zero transition, where I, I'm just a senior author, I just write some pieces now. But that started because I wanted data. Who's investing in wind? Who's investing in solar? Who's investing in uh, fuel cells? All those sorts of things. And there was no good data. You couldn't do a trend analysis. You couldn't really grasp the problem without that data. How much money were we investing in? So I started by building databases. So I can sort of, uh, that resonates with me. This, what you must have done is starting there and opening up the spreadsheet and start putting, structuring the data. Um, the second touch point for me was I was on the board of transport for London and you may uh, have, I'm sure you're familiar with what happened to Crossrail. So I was on the board of transport for London. I was on the finance committee when the extent to which it was off track was concealed from us. I was also on the board during our famous um, Garden Bridge adventure when um, then Mayor Boris wanted to build this garden bridge and the costs exploded and exploded and, and uh, almost looked like a chapter out of your book. So it's very, it was very personal for me reading uh, your book. And I, uh, thank you very much for, for both of those, building a data set and, um, and, and awakening these raw memories for me. Let's come back to that statistic though. It's one in 200 projects that is on time, on budget, and delivers the projected benefits. One in 200, half a percent. Why is that? Well, that's, that's one of the things that, we, that I've explored uh, thoroughly in my research and that we describe in the book. And there's two levels that you can look at it as, you know, like 
what we call causes and root causes. Uh, when people talk about causes, they they typically will talk about uh, you know it's just difficult to do projects and they're complex and in many projects you have to <laughs> you have to do construction and as soon as you start doing construction, you find things in the ground that you didn't expect or the weather is bad or whatever you know. So these are uh, what we call causes. We find that. Underneath those causes, there are what we call root causes. It goes much deeper than these uh, surface phenomena. And we say the root causes are two, and they're related to psychology. So our human psychology is one root cause, the way our brains work. The second is power. And that's, uh, uh, you know, about how uh, we jockey for position and for funds and so on. Also, as human beings, it's, it's, it's more a social aspect than a, a psychological aspect. And if we take uh, psychology first, it is very well documented uh, in behavioral science, behavioral economics, you know, by giants like Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky and uh, Richard Thaler at Chicago and so on, uh, that the that, uh, the human brain is biased. We have cognitive biases. The most prominent is probably optimism, you know, so we all optimists and you can see what happens with a budget if it's optimistic. Well, a, a, an optimistic budget is low and then you will have a cost overrun just as surely as the law of gravity works. I mean, if you're optimistic about a budget, it's going to be low and you're going to have an overrun on that budget on average. So uh, the same with the schedule. If you're optimistic about the schedule, you'll have a schedule overrun. If you're optimistic about the benefits, you won't have as many benefits as you thought you would have. So that's just optimism. And <laughs> cognitive scientists have documented over 200 biases to date, you know, and it's still increasing. New biases are being discovered all the time. So other biases are the planning fallacy, overconfidence uh, uh, bias, and the uh, uh, ease of retrieval, you know, and 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 many others. And uh, this means that the decisions that we make are actually not that good, you know. The decisions are biased. And the solution to that, if you want to get beyond that, you need to de-bias. And that we also describe in the book. We've actually developed methods for de-biasing, including a method called reference class forecasting. But it actually doesn't matter much, much which method it is. The important thing is that you take de-biasing seriously. And you realize, so this is the first thing I teach decision makers, is... You're biased. Because you're biased, your biggest risk is you. The biggest risk are not out there in the world, even though they are also out there, but that's not the biggest risk. The biggest risk is the way we perceive the risk. Once we have processed the risk through our brain, they come out optimistic. They come out uh, with misunderstanding what the base rates are, the, the odds that we are playing and so on. And, and uh, in order to avoid that, we need to de-bias things. So that's the psychology side, and that's the root cause there. On the power side, it's similar, but it's deliberate. So the psychology is not deliberate. This is something we do unconscious. We, we actually don't think about it mostly when we are optimistic. We are just optimistic. And, and we have all have had this experience, oh, shit, I did it again, you know, I was optimistic again. I thought I would be at my destination at this hour, but look, now I'm 15 minutes late again. You know, so this is something that's familiar to all of us in our behavior. The power thing is deliberate. It's very different. The result is the same, but it's, uh, it's deliberate. So if you and I wanted to make our project look good on paper, that's easy. And, and uh, you know, in some situations you want to do that because you're in competition with other projects for limited funding. So how do you deal with that? You make your project attractive on paper. How do you make your project look good for the beauty contest that is project selection? Well, you underestimate the cost so your project looks cheaper. Who doesn't like a, a, a cheap project? You underestimate the schedule so it looks like you can do the project faster. Who doesn't want their project fast? And you make the product look good by overestimating the benefits. This product is going to live, deliver a lot more nice and good things, you know, than will actually happen. And we know that, but we put it in the in the proposal. So now we have a fantastic proposal for the beauty contest, uh, and we have a higher uh, likelihood of winning the beauty contest that it's our project that gets funding, and we did it deliberately. And just as sure again as the law of gravity, 
works. If we did all these things, we're going to have cost overruns, scheduled overruns, and benefit shortfalls, right? And this is exactly the same as on the psychology side. So these two root causes reinforce each other. They they create a double whammy of cost overruns, scheduled overruns, and benefit shortfalls uh, with these two drivers. And if anybody who is listening or watching this hasn't figured it out yet, um, we're the reason that this is all about the climate is because we've got, uh, you found in your book, you looked at some of the worst projects in terms of being on time, on budget and delivering benefits are nuclear. And some of the best ones, the best category is actually solar. So it's very relevant for the climate change challenge, is it not? Yeah, absolutely. And this is actually, I would say climate projects are probably the most interesting type of projects of the 25 different type of projects that we look at. It's super interesting and, and, and strange in the way that they completely polarize. At one end, you have the worst performing projects, which would be nuclear, like you said, but also hydroelectric power. So big dams is the other uh, energy product. And that's kind of a, that's sad, you know, and a problem because both nuclear and hydroelectric power uh, are carbon free, right? Uh, more or less, you know, so it would be really great if they performed well and could be done fast, but instead they have huge cost overrun, uh, overruns and they have huge delays. They take a long time to do and uh, they become very, very expensive. But all is not lost because at the, at the very opposite end of the scale, we have uh, uh, solar uh, as the best performing product type of not only energy products, of any type of products that we've ever looked at, Solar is the best performing, meaning uh, the smallest cost over on one percent. It's nothing. It's basically on budget, on average, you know, and, and being built very quickly, on time, on budget, and not and and cheaper and cheaper. You know, so it's getting cheaper and cheaper. The same for wind power, not quite as 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 good, but very very good compared to other project types. Wind power, battery, same thing, you know. The, and the the explanation is which is something with, that we've looked into uh, in depth, you know, not only for energy products, but for all products. The explanation is that solar wind batteries are born modular. They're completely modular. So even, even so it's obvious for solar, solar panels, right? The solar cell is the basic module or the Lego, as we call it. Basic module, you put enough solar cells on a panel, well, then you have a solar panel. You put enough panels, uh, Together, you have an array. You put enough arrays out there, you have a solar farm. That's it, you know. It's just like uh, one module uh, builds the next, which builds the next, which builds the next. And if you don't have enough in one farm, you just build more farms. So this is what we call scale-free scalability. You can scale this at any scale. You can scale it up. You can scale it down. It's really easy. It's really cheap, and it's really fast. Wind, same thing, you know, a uh, wind turbine consists of four Legos. The first Lego is the foundation. The second Lego is the tower. The third Lego is the nacelle with a turbine. And the third Lego is the the wings or the blades that you put on the nacelle. Click, 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 and you have a turbine. And and literally, it used to take months to, to construct on a construction site wind turbines. Now it's done in one day because they are not constructed anymore. They are manufactured in factories, and then you just bring them on to the assembly sites and you assemble them. So it's become incredibly efficient. And that's actually our luck in the situation that we are in now. Same with batteries. We are so lucky that uh, there are energy technologies that we can really scale up at enormous speeds and to enormous scale, which is exactly what we need now in order to meet uh, the climate goals for 2030 and 2050. We don't have time to mess around anymore. We don't have time to mess around with nuclear. I wish I'm not anti-nuclear by any means. Even some people think that sometimes because I, I point out the numbers look bad for nuclear. Then people say he must be against nuclear. Now, if that isn't a dumb argument, I never saw one, you know. It's uh, it's about the numbers. I'm an economic ge geographer. I look at the economics and the economics for nuclear are, are this. It's really bad and I wish they were better. And I hope that small modular reactors might solve that eventually, but I wouldn't be holding my breath because we don't even have a prototype yet, you know. But the situation for energy in general uh, is this interesting polarization of really badly performing projects and really well-performing projects. 
Let's do this because rather than make it all about nuclear, I mean, of course, there's a, there's going to be a subtext uh, because nuclear are there are these nuclear power stations and waste storage. They are big things, and the you know there's a clue in the book how big things get done. Although you know, as you point out, big solar, big wind, big battery, giga gigafactories, and so on are also big things. But I don't want to make it just about nuclear. I actually want to try and extract because in your book you've got a number of heuristics. And I think we would do well to spend a bit of time on some of the other heuristics because they are relevant. And then maybe we can come and look at a, at a range of different net zero um, technologies uh, and see whether, you know, whether they are likely to be um, sort of at the bottom end of the scale or at the top end, the high performing or the low performing. Um, you've got one heuristic which you started the book with, which you call think slow, act fast. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so think slow uh, means deliberating. So you need to sit back and deliberate about what you're doing. So one of our cognitive biases is uh, availability bias. Our brains have a tendency to just grab the first idea that comes up and run with it. And uh, there's probably good evolutionary reasons for that, that, that we needed to be able to act fast, you know, when somebody popped up in our brain. And so that's a pattern we have. And again, it's very well documented by behavioral science. And this is, this is the characteristic of thinking fast. You just quickly grab an idea. And this is actually why Danny Kahneman's book is called Thinking Fast and Slow. You know, that's his famous bestseller uh, where he summarizes his work. Uh, it's called Thinking Fast and Slow. So thinking fast, when we talk about it, is a nod to Danny Kahneman, you know, like, yes, this is the way to do it. He is right. This is his argument in his book is that we need to think uh, slow and not fast because when we think fast, we make lots of errors. It's good. I mean, when you meet a lion on the savannah and the lion is uh, trying to eat you, you know, it's very good to think fast and run fast, you know. Uh, you don't want to sit down and deliberate. Uh, what do I do in this situation? So that's why we have these things from an evolutionary point of view. But I'm sure that anyone can see that it's not all decisions that you can use that decision-making uh, process on. And that's what Kahneman argues. So uh, we agree with him thinking fast. It's not a good idea for billion dollar projects or any, any important project that you do in your life. It might be, you know, uh, your wedding or buying a new home or the kitchen renovation that we talk about in the book. All of these things, you actually need to think slow which doesn't mean taking a long time. It just means taking sufficient time, adequate time to think through what it is that you're doing. And because uh, if you do that, you know, then you're able to act fast. And that's the second thing that Kahneman doesn't talk about, but that we talk about because we are about doing projects. So acting is absolutely crucial to what we do. And we are saying the preparation for acting fast is thinking slow. And only if you thought slowly, will you be able to act fast. And acting fast is extremely important to reduce your risks. The longer you take to do something, the more you expose yourself to risk, including black swan risks. So we look at that exposure as a window, a window in time. And by acting fast, you make that window smaller. You shorten the time it takes to deliver your project. And by, by, by making that window small, fewer bad things can fly through the window, including Big fat black swans, you know, they can't get through the window if you make it small. And therefore, you have a bigger chance of being successful with your project. So that's what we call the rhythm of a successful project is think slow, act fast. And only if you do that will you be successful. And you give a great example. Actually, there's a few examples in the book of um, the uh, uh, the Frank Gehry building in Bilbao, uh, and, you know, I said, I don't want to make this about nuclear, but nuclear is the opposite of that, right? N nuclear is in, where the window is so hard to close because it just takes long to build. And so all sorts of things can change. Politicians, re political regimes, earthquakes, all sorts of things can change. I mean, is that is that why you think fundamentally that nuclear won't be able to address its disadvantage in this game? So I wouldn't go so far as to say that it won't be able to address these issues forever. It might be in the future that it will be able to address these issues. But I would go so far as to say that so far, nuclear hasn't been able to address these issues in a way where, where you know, they have been addressed across a very large number of projects uh, and that you can just count on. We have a formula for how to do nuclear. We can do one successful project after the other. 
the historical evidence shows the exact opposite, including right now, you know, with the four uh, uh, nuclear reactors that have been built in the U.S., of which two have been given up, and the two that are being uh, the, the two that are being built on in Europe right now, that that are going way over budget and way over schedule. So it's not it's not uh, going well for nuclear, but that doesn't mean that it has to go bad for ever. But it is a problem, and and the key is that it just takes too long. It's too difficult, and uh, you have to get it right the first time. And you, it's also a problem that it's the major part is happening uh, on a construction site. So nuclear is actually is not built in factories mainly. It's built on sites, and that's a problem. It's it's much more difficult to control something on a construction site than it is to control something in a factory. Factories are, that's what they're for, basically. Factories are for controlling things, making things predictable, making every step in a process predictable. So you can do it over and over again, and you get better every time you do it. And because you get better, it gets cheaper and it gets faster. For nuclear, the exact opposite is happening. You do it, and then next time you do it, it takes longer because you found out that there are more things that you need to take into consideration. And because it takes longer and because there are more things you need to take into consideration, it also gets more expensive. And that's what happens with nuclear. And that's what we call negative learning. Curves. If things get slower and more expensive every time you do them, you have negative learning curves. You want to stay away from that like the pest, you know. It's what you don't want in the projects that you do. You want positive learning curves, which are the opposite, of course, which means that things get faster and cheaper every time you do them because you learn more and more. That's exactly what you want to do, and that's what going that's what's going to make you productive and successful in the long run. Yeah. And we had a you mentioned just earlier in this conversation small modular reactors. We had Tom Sampson, episode one hundred and sixteen, who talked about Rolls Royce's modular reactor it's not that small it's it's a half a gigawatt of uh of 470 megawatts but it's all made in a factory and brought to the site and only assembled on the site and that's something you talk about in your in your book i'm still on the fence as to whether that will drop because you've got a disadvantage of scale for making nuclear reactors small i mean the reason we made them big was you got all that effort you might as well make it huge and you get the economy of scale so the small ones start with a disadvantage but might catch up and i got to be honest i'm on, i'm i'm on the fence about uh, how how cheap it could it could become yeah i mean, and you're not alone and i don't mean myself i mean other people are skeptical about the physics of this you know that the physics the physical laws actually dictate that the nuclear reactors should be bigger you know 1 gigawatt and, and, and above and uh, therefore per definition uh, according to these people, uh, small modular reactors will be inefficient uh, because they don't realize the efficiencies of scale. And that is an issue. And uh, I still think that it's worth uh, experimenting with. This is a thing we, we talk a lot about in the book is experimentation. So we don't think of planning as, uh, as uh, you know, like a bureaucratic exercise where you just produce charts and paper. We think of planning as experimentation, you know, like you you actually uh, you you do uh, trial runs. You build mock-ups. You 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 build experiments, and you try out things, and that's part of the learning that you will do during the slow thinking. And that that uh, the successful project the leaders that we study, they actually do it that way. And we encourage that for nuclear too. You know, we still there's still stuff to learn about nuclear. I mean, it would be a pretty amazing thing if, if we could make nuclear work safely and cheaply. That would really be something, you know. So I think I think the price is so big that we should keep trying, and we certainly shouldn't have close will functioning nuclear power plants that are already up and running that some people are doing. You know, that's just that does not make much sense in the situation that we're in right now with the climate. Uh, so yeah, that's that's our position on this, and uh, we we would just say the verdict is still out. There's there's no clear answer, not even to the Rolls Royce. Uh, modular reactor you say that they are building it in a factory yeah hey wait a minute they're just they're developing a prototype now hopefully and we haven't seen it yet so they're actually not building anything in a factory yet you know but they will be hopefully in the future that's right the present tense they are building was doing a bit too much work there yeah. it is very interesting because if you look at for instance what's happening in space uh, which also you talk about in the book that you've gone from these you know huge nasa projects that are so complex 
that they kind of collapse under their own weight economically. And then you've got these entrepreneurs, people like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and others who um, who, who who can just operate at a completely different um, speed in terms of experimentation and learning. Uh, and then, you know, but we just sort of don't mind if they get one or two things wrong, if they, some of Elon Musk's rockets um, spontaneously disassemble, I believe it's called. We don't mind. <laughs> we we kind of would mind if a nuclear power station spontaneously disassembled. See, that's that's the thing about nuclear that the the demands are so much higher regarding safety and environment. Uh, so the bar is so much higher than for any other type of project that people actually have problems jumping over that bar. That's as simple as it is. It's just too difficult, you know, with a kind of with it with the knowledge uh, that we have today. Let's do a few more of your heuristics. Um, you've got one called um, "Take the Outside View." Uh, that's your that you've that's the title of the heuristic. What what does that refer to? Yeah, it refers to it's an opposite it's it's an opposite to the inside view, obviously. And the inside view is something again that has been documented in behavioral science that we tend to take an inside view on our actions, on our decisions, and on our projects. So we understand things inside out. That's our spontaneous way of, of uh, understanding something. So if we're doing a, a project, we'll think about what are the constituent parts of this project? What do I need to produce or buy in order to do the project? What will each item cost? You know, And you multiply the number of items with the unit cost and you eventually get a budget, right? That's, that's a, a typical inside out way of budgeting. The outside view does the opposite. It says, don't start on the inside, start on the outside. Simply look at similar projects to the one that you are now planning that have already been completed and look at what they cost. Then you will have a much more reliable estimate of your costs and a cost that hasn't been biased by your thinking, you know, by you trying to imagine what the project is going to look like and what elements are going into it and what these elements are going to cost. No, instead you're empirical and you simply ask what did these projects cost in the past? So that's an, that's a sort of a very simplified uh, description of the outside view versus the inside view. And again, it's clearly documented that the outside view is producing much more accurate uh, estimates of cost and schedule and benefits. So that's why uh, we recommend taking the outside view. It simply makes for a more accurate view of what it is that you're doing. You'll get a more accurate business case uh, for your decision or your project if you do it that way. So um, an example you use in the book is a couple uh, renovating their, their kitchen and then it becomes their house and so on. Um, this was very raw because I'm just about to do a renovation of the kitchen and the house. And um, so when the builder turns up with that plan, that Gantt chart, you know, the one that unrolls and has got all of the little things on it, I should say, put it away. How long did the last one take you? How long did the one before take you? And just go with that. Yeah, but the builder probably won't tell you that. Uh, so you have to be careful who you ask. You should ask actually your family and friends. Like just find out who have gone, like if you were doing a house renovation, who has done a house renovation over the past five, 10 years in, amongst your uh, friends and uh, family and colleagues, you know? And then you just ask them how much did that how how much did that go over budget, and some of them will say you know zero. It would be very rare. Some will say thirty percent, and some will say a hundred. That's actually the average, hundred percent. Some will say two hundred or four hundred, like the the poor couple in our book, you know, with their uh, house renovation that was started as a kitchen renovation, and. Uh, then you will simply take the, the estimate that the builder gives you and you would multiply it by this uh, cost overrun that you obtain from your friends and family. And now you have a reliable estimate. The builder's estimate will not be reliable and it's simple why. The builder cannot imagine all the unknown unknowns that are in your building. Like uh, there might be mold, hidden mold. There might be electrical installations that are not up to the current standards. But as soon as you start uh, ripping them out, you have to put in new ones that are, as soon as you start ripping walls and, and, and floors out, you actually, by law, have to put in uh, electricity, that uh, installation that, that live up to the current standards and so on and so forth. And the builder doesn't know any of this because they haven't seen what's behind your walls yet, so they can't imagine it, but they won't tell you that. Uh, 
And and therefore, you need this other way of going about it. You combine the builder's estimate with uh, your empirical cost overruns from your friends and family. So I'm smiling because the this is also relevant to something that I've done a lot of work on, which is hydrogen heating in homes, uh, where we have people say, well, we did it in the 1970s. We went from town gas, which was 50% hydrogen, uh, to natural gas, which is, of course, mainly methane, and it cost this, so we adjust for inflation, and that's what it should cost to go backwards. So it's like, wait a minute. We went from a dangerous gas to a safe gas. We went from leaky homes 40, 50 years later. Even in the UK, we now have more airtight homes, and now you want to go back. I, I would I would question that that's the assumption that you have airtight homes, you know, from personal experience, but that's a different question. Let's not get into that. Ah. But empirical data compared to 1970, we All absolutely right. do. We absolutely okay. do. Um, and, and so, that, but but the point is, where do you get your estimate from? Do you yeah. you know do you listen to somebody who is you know for instance um, very interested in selling hydrogen? Probably not. I suspect. Exactly. That that that's something you always need to take into account. I would say. I mean. I know builders that I've worked with for so many years that I trust them to a degree where I say, come on, give me the real estimate. Don't, don't, don't give me any bullshit. You know? Give me the real estimate. And they will do it and I would trust them. But it is more reliable to get a larger sample, you know, where you ask numerous people. And, and yeah. I would say you should have a minimum of 10, 15. But even if you only have five, it's a lot better than having nothing. I can guarantee you that. That's right. The lesson is if in doubt, build a database. Um, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Let's do another of your heuristics. You, you, you've got one called Watch Your Downside. And I suspect this is all well, I know because I've read the book. This is all about the, the, the fat tail. This is not, this is about the, the, the fact that things might, they're not going to, you know, there's a certain class of project that doesn't go 10% over or 10% under. It does something completely different, right? Yeah, they blow up basically. And, and, uh, the vast majority of project types that we have studied, uh, have fat tails. Uh, actually, Solar and wind power and uh, energy transmissions and roads and pipelines don't. They have thin tails, which means the risks are small and and easy to manage. All other project types have fat tails, you know, and uh, and that's why you really need to watch your downside when you're doing projects, uh, uh, because that's where the fat tails lie, of course. And uh, people often talk about the uh, uh, opportunities and risks as if they were. The metrical, you know, that you don't, you need to risk something in order to uh, get the opportunity. And that is true, of course, but there's a very fundamental asymmetry between opportunity and risk. And that is risk can kill you or put you out of business, you know, but it can kill you in some, in some instances, like if you are a pilot or, or doing extreme sports or mountain climb or whatever, uh, and in business, it can kill you, uh, your business, right? That That's what risk can do to you. There's no opportunity that can compensate for that. If you're dead, you're dead and you're out of business. So that's why the main focus needs to be not getting out of business, right? This, this is what people like Warren Buffett understand, that they always look at the downside first. And then, of course, you go for the upside. Once, you're, once you've got your downside covered, you can go for the opportunities. But you never, ever forget the downside. Never. You can forget the upside, uh, you know, for a period of time. Uh, because you can survive uh, still uh, if you don't uh, get uh, uh, get uh, knocked over by your downside. So that's that's the explanation why we say uh, watch your downside and and keep an eye on that. And uh, it might be you know existentially the most important piece of advice you can give anybody, a person or an organization. It's funny. So I do some angel investing, and one of the things I do with any company I invest in is I say. I want to see that you've got a risk register. Startups don't have risk registers generally, but I want to see it because the the thing that I slightly worry about, I know you're going to pivot. I know normal, there's kind of normal difficulties that are going to happen, but what are the things that can really kill your business that can really take it out completely unexpected or expected or whatever. So even startups, I try to, you know, to, to, to get them to watch their, their big downside. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that a risk register is a good start, but I, in my experience with people is that either people have this or they don't, you know, that it's it's much more of a mental attitude than it's about having a register. So somebody who doesn't understand downside, who develops a risk register is not very well helped, you know, by that risk register uh, compared to somebody who actually 
you know, it's in their guts, you know, this feeling about the uh, downside is dangerous. And that's what I need to protect myself against, you know. And and if you have that, you can actually do without a risk register. I wouldn't recommend doing without a risk register, yeah. but but it's the more important uh, thing for a person to have. And I would say, especially at the startup phase, you know, where things are, are small and nimble uh, and 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 uh, not so bureaucratic that you already have re- risk registers and so on. But what I'm actually doing, I think, as an investor, what I think I'm doing with the management is not asking them to do a bureaucratic exercise, is actually I'm signaling that I, as an investor, care about massive downsides, and I'm giving them a license to worry about things like, you know, cybersecurity, because a lot of investors are like, yeah, yeah, let's go, and we want you to build the thing and move fast, break things. But I'm actually saying, hang on a second, yeah, but don't don't make stupid mistakes that cost you the whole company. So I'm sending a certain message yeah. rather than doing a bureaucratic exercise, I think. Yeah, no, no, I think that you would be doing that. I, and I'm in total agreement with that approach. I'm just saying that some people think if they have a risk rate to this thing on paper, then they're covered. That's not enough. That's all I'm trying to say here. Oh, the other thing I do is when bad things happen, I force them to pull out the register and say, well, was this bad thing? You said that now we're delaying the launch of a product. Was that on your risk? Was the reason on your risk register or not? So you have to, yeah, yeah. Clo- you have to close these loops, don't you? I, I like that. Yeah. Um, I was very interested that you've got one of the projects that you've mentioned that outperforms, that uh, that is up there with the sort of more Lego projects like solar and wind and so on, is transmission. And I was interested in that because... Um, transmission is at the heart, by the way, of the challenges around the net zero tra- uh, transition. Right? Um, because we're going to electrify so much, and because renewable energy comes from new places and it's variable, transmission is really, really important. And it's taking way too long, 10, 15 years to build transmission. And yet here it pops up and you're saying, no, it's, it may be, presumably you're saying it may take long, but at least it's hitting budget and it's doing what it says on the tin. Yeah, uh, I think I, I think it can be done. I saw a really worrying article the other day, I think in the Financial Times, about how the UK's grid is not uh, even able to, uh, it, it's not even able to connect, you know, all the the wind farms and so on that are being built now. So there there are billions and billions of pounds worth of investments that cannot be used. You know, this is a tragedy. You know, so gl- then it, let me just say it's global. There's a connection pipeline, a connection queue in the U.S. that is bigger than all of the renewables that have been built to date. Yeah. Um, there's the same sort of even in Scandinavia. Um, it, it, I, I was at a, I actually chaired a conference, and the problem between northern Norway and southern Norway there's a a break, almost a break in the in the grid, and it's yeah. going to take a decade to do something about it. This is a universal problem. We need to figure out a way to do that fast. And uh, the way to uh, do that is to build on the parts of the grid that are modular. And there are lots of parts that are modular. And just like make that more efficient, like we made everything more efficient for solar and wind and batteries. You know, we need to do the same for the grid. And and it looks like the the the, the grid has inherent elements that would actually allow that. So that's something that needs to be given higher priority. I don't know if if somebody has been sleeping and not thinking that the grid needed to be brought up to standard in order to be able to accommodate all those uh, uh, new energy sources that uh, are, are going to be plugged into it. And that's just one thing. Then we also need the, the, the big connectors, you know, between different countries and so on, like Norway and Denmark uh, has a connector where you can run electricity back and forth, which is usual because Denmark is wind and Norway is hydro. So Denmark can use Norway as a big hydro battery, you know, when uh, Denmark, which is actually happens certain days, the country produces 150% uh, of their electricity needs. So 50% would have to be lost if it wasn't sent to Norway to pump water into into hydroelectric dams and and this is happening elsewhere this is what we need more of you know interconnectors that so that uh i mean the 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 concept of the grid that we have today and or have had up until today is too small you know we can't have grids that are so local they need to be much much bigger geographically in order to even out loads and even to send loads between different grids absolutely i agree you asked the question, why were people asleep? I think what you've got is because of 
um, energy efficiency improvements, for instance, LED lighting or more efficient motors, uh, what you actually saw over the last 15 years is electricity demand in the developed world uh, declining. So the UK in 2005 used 37% more electricity in the domestic sector than it is using today. Yep. Against that backdrop, somebody has to go and okay these huge monumental investments for the stuff you're talking about. So lots more electricity, more renewables, interconnections, and so on. And I'm trying to think how you would modularize what's essentially a backbone. You know, it, the, the, the transmission grids, all grids, are they're almost sort of, they're not quite monopolies, but they are place-to-place -place monopolies. And how do you modularize? I can see how you can modularize installation of a cable or, or building pylons, but the actual grid itself kind of feels like one of a kind well no i don't think so maybe maybe when it's built out but the the individual elements of the grid are not one of a kind so substations are not one of a kind uh, for instance and uh, and cables are not one of a kind uh, they can be built in modular fashion and the way to drive efficiencies on that is to create competition uh, between the people who are delivering this so I would see that the owners of the grid, that's the demand. You know, they're demanding these things, uh, but there's a market that they're demanding it from. That market needs to be incentivized to become more efficient. And, and I think that, that that can be done just as it's been done in other areas. So I know that um, one of the guests on our uh, cleaning up from a couple of years ago, Greg Jackson, who's the CEO of Octopus, I know that he would agree that if National Grid can't build a link that he needs, he should be allowed to go in and bid and you know get get regulated and and uh, win the right to do that um but the planning permission the thing that takes a lot of the time is actually getting social license actually getting doing the consultations um doing you know only one company can do the engineering case, business case creation for a new link uh you know connecting to the grid so there are some things that feel hard to break up into your to lego eyes well, that's the process itself, and but actually we give examples in the book about how you can modularize process. It's actually important to think about both process and uh, products here, and uh, and not just think modularity applies to products. Uh, it also applies to process. But I don't think that's the only problem here. I do think that uh, that uh, the process needs to be of approval, needs to be, be made more efficient. But another thing that is even more important, or just as important, is that people need to think ahead. So the example that you just gave, you know, that uh, electricity demand has been falling because of increased efficiency, that's all very well, but it's been clear for a long, long time that the future is uh, electrification. So uh, it, it, it's, been, it's been clear that, uh, that we would need these types of grids for quite a while, and there's actually no point in building all the wind farms and solar farms and so on if we don't have a grid that they can plug into. So I think that this this indicates to me that the, the people responsible for the grid haven't been thinking slow, actually thinking what is actually happening here. And we might have increased efficiencies right now, but what will it look like in five, 10 years? And five, 10 years from now, it's going to be very different. See, I, I think there's, some, there's another piece to it, which is defining corridors, clean energy corridors, clean power corridors, and just pre-permitting and pre-getting all of the kind of social license piece done ahead of when you actually need the power to be built. But there's a lot of things that would need to be done. Um, in fact, there's a nice example in your book, which is um, Terminal 5. You talked about not just, um, uh, what, what did you call it? You turn um, the milestones, you talked about using inch stones. You know, if you really have got one big project, break it into, and, and really make sure you're hitting your inch stones, not just your milestones. Yeah, yeah. So this is a concept we actually developed on a project we were called onto in Hong Kong, a high-speed rail project, the, the only 100% underground high-speed rail line in the world with the biggest uh, underground uh, high-speed rail station in the world smack, it, world, smack in the center of Hong Kong. And it wasn't going well. So uh, uh, midway through, you know, uh, uh, the, the project was broken with uh, cost overruns, scheduled overruns. Uh, flooded tunnel, a tunnel boring machine underwater and so on, like really bad. Uh, 
but actually not not so much worse than any other project. Uh, it, it, it happens much more than you think. And that's what explained the numbers that we started out uh, talking about. Uh, and that's that's where we invented install. So we basically reprogrammed the whole thing, you know, and said, okay, uh, we need to know from now until the opening date, everything needs to be broken down and it needs to be completely clear what happens and who's responsible for what. And also, how do we escalate this uh, if it starts going wrong again? Uh, what happens? Who's responsible? In order to make sure that we wouldn't have further delays while people found out who was responsible and what to do and so on. And that's what installs are really good for. And, and, and I highly recommend them uh, for projects where you really want to make sure that you meet the deadlines and the budget. And you have something to celebrate along the way, every inch. You've got a bit of a... Yeah, yeah that's a true. That, that, that's true. And, and we also develop early warning uh, systems, you know, where immediately, within a week, you know, something goes wrong, it'll be flagged to the leadership. So often what happens is things start to go wrong and people are afraid to escalate it to the top. Uh, so bad news travels slow, you know. And that's the slowness you don't want. You want bad news to travel fast, so you need to develop a culture where it, it's actually not only legitimate, but encouraged that if, if something is beginning to go wrong, everybody on the project has a duty to report it to the leadership. So we develop systems like that too. Again, something that is hugely recommended. And and Terminal 5, we're very good. Terminal 5 at Heathrow that you you mentioned. We, have, we made a point in this book of actually going out and identifying a lot of successful projects because it's just too depressing to keep talking about the failures. Uh, I find, and uh, and I wanted this book to be a joy to write, you know, so we made sure to find lots of examples of success where we could pick the brains of the people who were responsible for these successes, see how they think, see how their cognitive biases are different from ordinary people's cognitive biases and so on. Or, or did they maybe get lucky? And the reason I say that is you um, on the Terminal 5 build, that's a chap called uh, Andrew Wollstonecall, right? Yep. Who was later responsible for Crossrail. And I was on the board, I was on the finance committee. <laughs> and yeah. basically, information, it went horribly. It did all the things that, 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 that you talk about for the bad, the, all the bad things in the book. And information was withheld from us on the finance committee of transport for london uh i don't know whether he individually was responsible um but certainly by the management of transport for london there was key information about this thing spiraling out of control and the mayor interestingly had taken the the there was one board member of tfl who was also on the board of crossrail but he was a conservative um and so as soon as sadiq khan took over he was fired from that role and then we had no governance link. We had no direct board-to-board -board information link. It all was filtered through management. Mm. And, you know, and when we were probing, we were not, you know, the, the information was not provided. But that was under the same executive that you have as um, presiding over one of, the, one of the success stories in your book. Yep, that is true. And uh, we don't, uh, we don't, uh, we don't ask for anybody to be perfect, you know. Uh, but we, we do ask for when we study success, that it's highly unlikely that it was luck, you know, and, uh, and, and, and we do that by looking at people who have provided, who have been able to deliver success several times. And, and Andrew Wilson home actually has been able to deliver success several times. And, uh, it's very unfortunate what happened uh, with Crossrail, but it's a classic. There's even, there's an article in this week's economist about it. And, uh, even they get it wrong, and they're usually pretty good journalists at the uh, at the economists. They say that the reason that we had the delays and the cost overruns is because it's very complex to build under a city like London. They actually got that pretty well, you know. They were very good at that. It was the IT, you know, and it's often the IT that is the problem. So, the signaling systems, the safety systems, and so on, uh, had been underestimated. So this is optimism. You see how we get right back to the root causes here. It actually turned out, and I've discussed this in depth with Andrew Wilson, who, you know, directly face to face, uh, we actually, we, we do executive training together, uh, at Oxford university and elsewhere. And, um, he, uh, acknowledges that they were optimistic about how long it would take to make the signaling systems and the safety systems reliable. 
Maybe, right? Because okay. there may be a little bit of bias in his um, diagnosis because certainly, um, you know, after it became absolutely clear, and I mean, just for the listeners who don't know, um, you know, in July, we're supposed to believe that in July or August 2018, and the, the Queen, bless her, was supposed to come and open it in December 2018, we were told it was still on track. We were being told it's still on track. And of course, it ended up being delayed by four years. Afterwards, all the stories emerged uh, about how everybody working on it knew it was off track. The only people who didn't know or didn't want to know, or didn't want to believe it, were the higher echelons within Crossrail and particularly within Transport for London, including the commissioner who, you know, evidence came out afterwards had actually interrupted that information flow and changed the information that was supposed to be given to us on the board and is now going off and doing other project was was you know was given was the you know given his honors and is now doing i think it's the renovation of the house of the um um uh, houses of parliament project you know this was this was not a well-managed project with an it problem okay I mean, you may you may have inside information that I don't have, but all I can say is that that's a classic, you know, that the, that the information doesn't percolate to the top where it should go, and that's exactly what you need to avoid. That's how we designed, like the the high street rail project that I explained about in Hong Kong. We designed it in a way that would do exactly the opposite of what happened on Crossway, and it actually worked. You know, it that was so uh, that was delivered to the schedule that we developed like that that we program with the installs and it was delivered to the budget that we estimated at that time halfway through the project so we eliminated we eliminated the optimism that has been in the project from the outset midway through we rebaselined everything reconfigured everything reprogrammed everything and and uh, debiased everything including the optimism bias and got a realistic estimate you know like we talked about for the kitchen renovation or home renovation before that's what we made for the high speed rail line and they deliver it to that. So to be fair, to sort of complete on the Transport for London uh, experience, we also had the Garden Bridge, where the the only thing I ever signed off on on the Finance Committee was, I think it was £4 million to do a feasibility study, where I tried to set the condition that we would not put money into it, uh, uh, that it because it was supposed to be all private sector. And it ended up, I believe we ended up spending 40 or 50 million. I still don't know where it went. I have no idea. I don't think anybody knows where the actual cash ended up. Uh, the the budget exploded to 200 plus and it eventually got killed uh, by Sadiq Khan, uh, eventually after a lot of toing and froing. Yeah. I'm conscious of time then. I want to finish, if I could, rapid fire, if I might, some of the other technologies around the net zero transition, your thoughts about whether they're likely to be, you know, if you could kind of keep it short, just say, well, you know, sounds like it's going to be easy. Sounds like it's going to, ooh, that one makes me worried, um, if that's okay with you. So um, uh, I've got a long distance cable. I will, I'm an investor. It's a cable from Morocco uh, all the way around the coast, laying it under the sea and coming into the UK. Is that going to be a... Top of the table or a bottom of the? Is it going to be a, 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 a an under, you know, a, a bad performer or down with solar and and wind? Is going to be a good performer. Uh, it's going to be hugely expensive, but if done right, it's a good performer. Okay. Um, what about um, heat pumps? We need to switch heat pumps over to. Well, you know, I'm 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 prejudging. I've already sort of revealed my bias against hydrogen for heating. So rolling out heat pumps, going to go according to plan as a program or not? Uh, it depends on you talk about uh, air to air heat pumps or ground to air heat pumps, you know. Uh, uh, in Denmark, uh, where I'm from, there's some resistance to the air heat pumps because they make noise, you know. So you get them in a neighborhood, you get noise and that's a problem. And, and it would be nice to have that solved. But overall, I think heat pumps are uh, uh, you know, they can be delivered hugely successful, fast, they are very modular. And uh, the good thing about them is that you don't need a whole system you know, or you can do it individually on, 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 on each home. And it's being done now. I mean, there's lots of heat pumps going in uh, around uh, Northern Europe. So episode 122, we had Professor Sir Chris Llewellyn-Smith, who's looked at what do you do for long duration storage? 
I, I completely agree, interconnections and so on. But there are times, the Germans call it the Dunkelflaute, where they're just, there are weeks with low wind. And what Llewellyn Smith has discovered is they might happen year after year for a few years. You could have some bad wind years and then have a Dunkelflaute. So his solution is hydrogen storage deep underground in salt caverns. Right. There are lots of different uh, solutions. So, I, so I'm not a specialist on the on all the different alternatives well, for energy well, storage. But would that be an easy type of project to get? You know, if, if it was, if you were consulting to somebody trying to build one, would that fill you with? Would that be an easy or a difficult in your book? So I, I wouldn't be able to call that one. I don't know enough about the details, but I do know that there's enough alternatives that that we uh, we are going to find something, and and there's no question that we need something for that kind of situation. There has to be some kind of, uh, you know, uh, base load that we can always deliver, uh, uh, even when the, the wind is not blowing and the sun is not shining. Another one where I, again, I will confess that I, uh, it's a company that I advise in this case, episode 58, John Redfern, closed loop geothermal. You go very far down. This is high temperature geothermal, not ground source heat pumps. You go three, four kilometers down. You go a few kilometers out. You're drilling, drilling, drilling. And then you're linking it up to make an underground radiator to bring out the heat. Is that the sort of thing that tends to go well, or or or, or is that going to be a fat tail type one? Again, I'm not a specialist here, but I've 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 heard people that I trust saying that that's extremely risky. Like like drilling very long uh, holes into the ground like that is very risky. So that's all I know about that. Uh, I also know that that. Uh, Geothermal has been used for a long time in Iceland, for instance, so that there are good uh, uh, geothermal plants that actually work. So this one, I think John would say, ah, you know, uh, Professor Fluberg is, Fluber is is talking about fracking or about having to, you know, so he's doing no, 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 no. just no. it's only the drilling, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was not I was not associating this with fracking at all. Uh, no. uh, I was th I was thinking of exactly that kind of drilling and, and what I'm saying is I don't know enough about okay. it. I'm not an engineer on this issue, but I've heard people say it's risky. Okay, so that's a few of the new business models, a few of the things that we're likely to see, you know, evolving uh, during the transition. But overall then, final question, um, with all your knowledge about projects, how they can go wrong, most of them 99.5% currently, but hopefully an inc uh, a, a less and less if people read your book, which they should. <laughs> um, but the transition overall, are you optimistic or are you not optimistic? If you talk about the energy transition, I am optimistic. And this is actually one of the things I discovered while doing the research for the book is that, wow, we're actually lucky that the things that we need are being developed at speed and at scale right now, uh, uh, following the, the basic, uh, the basic heuristics, you know, if you wish that we, that we lay out in the book. So I'm optimistic about the situation. I think that it's a, it's all about electrification now. Uh, if we're talking about the energy transition, and then we need to produce that electricity on the basis of renewables. And uh, and uh, from what I've seen, that can be done. We can do that. Ben, Professor Fluber, enormous pleasure uh, speaking with you today. Thank you so much for sharing time with us here on Cleaning Up. The pleasure is mine. Thank you so much for having me. So that was Professor Ben Flubia world's leading expert on the subject of project delivery and author of How Big Things Get Done. As always, we'll put links in the show notes to the episodes we mentioned during our conversation. So that is episode 58 with John Redfern, CEO of Ever Technologies, episode 92 with Simon Morish, CEO of Xlinks, episode 116 with Tom Sampson, the former CEO of Rolls-Royce SMR, and episode 122 with Professor Sir Chris Llewellyn-Smith. If you've enjoyed today's conversation, please remember to like, share, and subscribe to Cleaning Up, or leave us a review on your chosen podcast platform. And if you want more from Cleaning Up, sign up for our free newsletter at cleaningup.live, where you'll find our archive of over 150 hours of conversation with extraordinary climate leaders. And why not help someone else learn more about the net zero transition 
by introducing them to Cleaning Up. Cleaning Up is brought to you by our lead supporter, Capricorn Investment Group, the Liebreich Foundation, and the Gilardini Foundation.